Hello! So have you ever been confused by what all these video options mean? I know I don't understand all the acronyms or what actually the quality settings do and what effect they have on your gameplay and your frame rate. So I've spent the last few days going through and actually studying graphic settings and all the acronyms and how they affect the game. Now this is made a bit trickier by the fact that different engines, different developers and different games use different terms for the same thing. So rather than try and cover everything, I'm going to go through the Battlefield 4 settings, particularly those that affect your frame rate or your gameplay experience in multiplayer. And the first thing we're going to look at is surprisingly full screen mode. Now you get three options, windowed mode, borderless mode and full screen mode. Now I don't understand why anybody would use windowed mode, but borderless mode is used by a lot of people that do recordings or streaming because it allows you to alt tab to your recording software really quickly. The problem is your frame rate will be lower in borderless mode than it is in full screen, particularly if you're running dual graphics cards or a graphics card with two GPUs on it. In full screen mode both of those graphics cards or both of those GPUs will concentrate on running the game. In borderless mode you will only get one running the game and the other one will be involved in Windows processes. So you have a choice, you can have borderless mode which lets you switch applications faster but has a lower frame rate or full screen mode which has a higher frame rate but is slower to switch applications. Next we have something that causes a lot of confusion and that's V-Sync or vertical synchronization. Most people don't know exactly what it does. What V-Sync does is it reduces screen tearing. Now it's called vertical synchronization because screen tearing happens in horizontal lines across the screen. And what it's caused by is a frame being written to the screen before the previous frame has finished. Your monitor has a refresh rate, that's the number of frames it can display in a second. You also have a frame rate that your graphics card is putting out to the monitor. If you have a 60Hz monitor it's capable of displaying 60 frames a second, but if your graphics card is putting out 90 frames a second then that can cause screen tearing because your monitor can't keep up with the number of frames that the graphics card is sending it. VSync fixes this by restricting the frame rate of the game to be the same as the refresh rate of the monitor, so if you've got a 60Hz monitor it caps the frame rate to 60 frames a second. So if you're seeing those horizontal lines across the screen where things don't quite line up then you need to turn VSync on. If you're not then leave it off. The next thing to look at is field of view and this is basically how much of the world you can see. If you set it to its minimum value of 60 you can see a 60 degree arc in front of you. If you set it to 120 you can see a 120 degree arc. But the higher you set your field of view the smaller objects directly in front of you will appear and the more distorted objects to the side of you will appear. You get that kind of fishbowl look. But of course you also take a hit in frame rate with a high field of view because the wider the angle you can see the more objects it has to draw on the screen. Now the drop in frame rate isn't really that noticeable unless you're using an older graphics card and if you drop your frame rate too low you're going to lose any peripheral vision so probably the best setting is 90 degrees. If you are struggling for frame rate on an older graphics card then you can lower it but it really isn't going to make an awful lot of difference. Next we have motion blur. Now when you move objects in your peripheral vision tend to blur. The faster you move the more blurred they become. And motion blur mimics this effect in game. Now it's fine for a single player game it makes things look more realistic but in a multiplayer game it actually hampers what you can see on the screen. So despite it having little effect on the frame rate, turn motion blur off. Next we get to weapon depth of field. Now again this is a blurring effect. When you aim down sights it keeps the centre of the screen and the gun model sharp but the edges of the screen blur out to represent you focusing down the barrel. Now if you put your hand in front of your face you'll notice that your hand is in focus but everything behind it blurs out. That's depth of field. Now again this has very little effect on the frame rate because it's a post processing effect applied after all the rendering has been done. But in multiplayer games turn it off because it blurs out things at the edges of the screen and makes them harder to see. Next we have resolution scale but I'm not going to talk about this at this point I'm going to talk about it when we get to anti-aliasing because it has a very similar effect. Next we have texture quality 
Now a texture is what makes an object look like a real object in the game. So if you've got a wall, instead of looking like a blank wall, they'll make a texture that looks like concrete and just map it over that wall and any wall they want to make look like concrete. Texture quality is simply the resolution at which those textures are displayed. So the higher the setting, the higher the resolution of the textures. This has very little effect on the frame rate. It basically just uses more memory on your graphics card. So the best setting for this is high or ultra. The game will still run smoothly and it will look a lot better. Next we have texture filtering, or as it's called in a lot of games, an isotropic filtering. Textures that are close to the character are displayed in high resolution. Textures further away are displayed in lower resolution. But those further away textures can look kind of jagged or blocky and the transitions between higher quality and lower quality textures can stand out a mile. So what texture filtering does is smooth all that out. It smooths the transitions between textures and it smooths out the textures themselves so you don't notice that drop in quality. Like texture quality, texture filtering doesn't have much effect on the frame rate, but it does make the game look a lot better. So I'd have this on high or ultra. Lighting quality affects how detailed the lighting and shadows are represented in the game. So things like the cloud shadow effects on the ground or how smoothly a light side of an object will transition into a shadowed side of an object. With the lighting quality set to low, the effect is very harsh. There are no smooth transition between light and shadow. It's very jagged and very stark. But there's very little noticeable difference between medium, high and ultra. So to get good looking lighting with a minimum effect on frame rate, set the lighting quality to medium. Effects quality controls the look of things like explosions and smoke effects. Now if you set this onto high and ultra, you are going to get a lot of particle effects on the screen and the frame rate does drop. But it also has an effect on the gameplay because those more detailed smoke and explosion effects block your view more than if you've got them on the lower quality settings. Now the low quality setting is fine, but it can look harsh at times. So again, this is one of those settings that I think medium is probably the best compromise between how the game looks and the frame rate you're going to get. Post-process quality controls things like light bloom, glare, reflections and the shimmering effect you get on water. Now these are all fine in single player games because they make it look very pretty. But in a multiplayer shooter, they're totally unnecessary and they do affect your frame rate quite severely and light bloom is an effect you really do not want. What light bloom is, is when you walk from a dark area into a light area, it represents that time it takes your eyes to adjust. So in game, it turns the brightness up for a while and you can't see as well. So you don't want that effect when you're in a multiplayer shooter, so set this to low. Now we come to mesh quality. Now what is a mesh? A mesh is actually an object that's modeled in the game. If you looked at a rock in the engine before it's had textures or smoothing effects put on it, it's actually made up of lots of geometric shapes. When you put all those together, it kind of looks like a mesh, and that's why they're called mesh objects. Mesh quality controls the details of those objects close up and the draw distance of how far away you can see them. In other engines, this is often called tessellation, and what it does is the higher the mesh quality, the smaller those geometric shapes are that make up an object. That gives more detail to objects and it smooths out rounded objects. In Battlefield 4, mesh quality also controls the draw distance of objects. So at low settings, decorative objects disappear earlier as the player's viewpoint moves away from the object. This can cause that effect of an object just popping into view as you move towards it. But the biggest reason that mesh quality is an important setting is it also controls the draw distance for players. So if you're a sniper or if you're in a tank and you're taking those long range shots, you need your mesh quality as high as possible. In fact, for every player, I would recommend you run your mesh quality on ultra. If you can't see somebody, you can't shoot somebody. And if they've got their mesh quality on ultra, they can see you while you can't see them. Terrain quality is very similar to mesh quality, except of course that it's modelling the terrain. If you consider the terrain as just being a large object, well that's made up of these geometric shapes as well. The higher the terrain quality, the smaller those geometric shapes are. And it also controls the draw distance at which you see those more detailed geometric shapes. 
With terrain quality set to medium or high, you often suffer from what is called terrain popping, where the details of the terrain will suddenly appear as you get closer to them. Now this isn't particularly noticeable when you're playing infantry on foot, but when you're in a vehicle or an aircraft, it is very noticeable when the terrain starts popping in. Strangely, both the low and ultra settings for terrain quality reduce terrain popping, because if you've got it set to low, then you're almost always seeing the low quality terrain, so you don't get any popping. Conversely, if you've got it set to ultra, then you're almost always seeing the most detailed version of the terrain, and so you don't get any popping either. So your choice is either low or ultra. Again, it's a trade-off between better visuals, but a slightly lower frame rate, or a slightly higher frame rate, but worse visuals. Now, terrain decoration is a tricky subject, because there is a kind of bug in it. Some people are affected by a bug where terrain decoration doesn't look as good as it should. Some people say it's better on low settings than it is on ultra settings. Other people say it's better on ultra than it is on low. Then you look at people's videos and some people just see more objects than others at the same settings. Now I seem to see far less terrain decoration on my new NVIDIA 980 Ti than I did on my old AMD HD 7970. But no one seems to know what the problem is, or even if there is a problem. If it's just something to do with graphics cards, or drivers, or the engine, nobody really knows. So the only thing we can say with terrain decoration is try it out yourself. Try the different settings, see what it looks like, and see what the frame rate is like. Because if I give you a recommended setting, it might look awful on your PC setup. Now we get onto the more technical settings where the acronyms start. So we look at anti-aliasing. We've got anti-aliasing deferred and anti-aliasing post. But we also have a third anti-aliasing setting within Battlefield 4. And that's the resolution scale setting that I skipped over earlier. Before we look at those settings, let's work out what anti-aliasing actually is. Everything you see on the screen is made up of pixels, which are small square blocks of colour. But because they're square, it means they only have horizontal and vertical edges. So if you do a horizontal line, you get a nice smooth edge. Similarly, with vertical lines, they're very smooth. But if you get a diagonal line, it looks jagged along the edges. That's because you're trying to make a diagonal edge out of something that only has horizontal and vertical edges. What anti-aliasing does is blends the colours to try and disguise those jagged edges. So if you draw a black diagonal line on a white screen, what you end up with is shades of grey at the edges of that line to try and disguise just how jagged those edges are. So that's anti-aliasing. It's a way of disguising that your graphics are actually made up of little square blocks. The first type of anti-aliasing we have in Battlefield 4 is anti-aliasing deferred, which is actually multi-sampling anti-aliasing. MSAA works by looking at the actual raw data of what's being displayed on the screen. So it looks at the shapes of those polygons, works out which ones are going to cause jagged diagonal lines, and then applies anti-aliasing only to those areas. In Battlefield 4 we have 2 times MSAA or 4 times MSAA. So in 2 times MSAA it will look at those edges, smooth it, then take those smooth edges, look at them again, and smooth them again to make it even smoother. In four times MSAA, it does that step four times. So the more steps it does, the smoother those edges look. But of course, those extra steps take more processing by your graphics card, and so you end up with a lower frame rate. The second form of AA we have is anti-aliasing post, which is actually fast approximate anti-aliasing. Now this isn't true anti-aliasing, but as its name applies, it is fast. Rather than looking at the raw graphics data like MXAA and working out which shapes are going to have edges on, it takes each individual frame produced by the graphics card and treats it as a picture, and then tries to spot those hard edges in that picture. But as its name also implies, it's approximate. It doesn't do as good a job as MSAA. At lower settings it's still quite jagged, and at higher settings it can cause the image to be a bit blurry. The advantage with FXAA is that the graphics card has to process a lot less information and therefore you get a better frame rate. And there's very little difference in frame rate between low and ultra, it's just a balance between the jagged edges and the blurring effect. The final form of anti-aliasing is the resolution scale that I skipped over earlier, 
because this is actually super sampling anti-aliasing. This works by getting your graphics card to work in a higher resolution than it's going to display to the screen. So if your monitor is 1920 by 1080 and you set super sampling to 200, it's actually going to double the resolution. So the graphics card is going to be working at 3840 by 2160. When you double the resolution, you make the pixels four times smaller, so the image is a lot more detailed and those edges are a lot smoother. The graphics card then applies all the effects to this smoother, more detailed version of the image and then downsizes it to display it to the screen. This is the best looking method of anti-aliasing on Battlefield 4, but because the pixels are smaller and the resolution is higher, the graphics card is working harder, so the frame rate does suffer. So which version of anti-aliasing should you pick? Or which versions? Because you can run more than one at once. And like I've said several times in this video, it's a trade-off between the graphics quality and the frame rate. If you want the best graphics quality, use resolution scaling, and you move that slider up as high as you can while still getting an acceptable frame rate. If you want the best frame rate, you use FXAA, you can turn it up to max, and it's not going to impact your frame rate very much but you can also add a bit of resolution scaling. A resolution scale of 120% is not really going to affect your frame rate at all, but it will make the FXAA look better. So, FXAA max, resolution scaling 120%. The final setting we've got to look at is ambient occlusion. So this is the handling of shadows in the game. If you get a light source, and an object, you know the object is going to have a shadow on the side away from the light source and a shadow on the ground. But the object might also be in the shadow of another object, so it's getting less light, so its own shadows are going to be deeper. Trying to ray trace every light source and how it affects every object in the game and how the shadow of every object affects every other object would take a lot of processing power. So what ambient occlusion tries to do is mimic this without all the processing. SSAO or Screen Space AO was originally developed for the Cry Engine and the original Crisis game. What it does is it looks at the depth of pixels. If we imagine a cliff face, you're going to have areas of the cliff that are sunken into the cliff face and you're going to have areas that project out from the cliff face. Those areas that project outwards are going to block the light from reaching the areas that are deeper. SSAO provides more shadow to those deeper areas and makes the projecting areas brighter. It then goes through the process again to see how those new bright areas and shadows will affect other objects in the scene. HBAO, or Horizon Based Ambient Occlusion, does a very similar process, except it repeats those steps more times. Now that would take a lot more processing power. To counteract this processing cost, it works at a lower resolution. So HBAO gives you a better overall effect of how the light and shadows from objects affect other objects. The actual shadows themselves aren't necessarily as detailed as SSAO. Ambient occlusion is another one of those settings that's a trade-off between frame rate and graphic quality. The more detailed shadows make the game look nice, but they don't affect the gameplay, so you can quite happily turn ambient occlusion off. That's it, that's graphic settings, particularly those that apply to Battlefield 4, explained as well as I can manage it. Hopefully I've kept it simple enough that it's understandable, but detailed enough so you actually know what the graphic settings do. Now I realise I haven't shown any in-game footage of how changing the graphic settings changes the visuals in the game. If I did that in this video, it would be way too long. It's already going to be about 20 minutes long as it is. So I'll do a second video that compares the graphical quality and frame rate of the Battlefield 4 presets, low, medium, high and ultra, and compare those to what this research says are the best settings to get graphical quality and frame rate. I hope you found this video informative and maybe a bit interesting. Graphic settings aren't the most interesting subject in the world, but if you get them right, it will improve your gameplay experience. So if you've made it this far into the video, congratulations and thanks for watching.